Hello and welcome to Stoke to Be Here, a podcast by Stella Tandem. My name is Laura and I'm the stoker on the back seat of our tandem bicycle, which we hope to break the record for circumnavigating the world in 2022. This week, I'm talking to Marcy Roberts to get some great tips on endurance cycling. Hopefully, um, she'll have some good tips and we'll be able to share them with you listeners as well to inspire you to go on your own epic rides. So, Marcia, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, you're known as Marcia Roberts, but you're also Mawona Velo. Have I said that correctly? Mawona Velo. Mawona so, Velo. For, so if you take the letters, it stands for middle-aged woman on a bike. Yeah, which is, <laughs> <laughs> it's a, a pretty good tagline to have. Um, yeah, and what, what kind of made you, you choose that? Because it's... Obviously, yeah, it, it describes what you are, but is that something you, you kind of want to promote? Is it something, do you feel that makes you a bit different? I think it does. Um, a lot of people um, out there riding are considerably younger than me. Um, or, I'm going to stereotype a little bit, <laughs> are very much cafe cyclists at my age. And I, I want to let people know that just because you're in your 50s, it doesn't mean that you can't have these massive goals and you can't do um, endurance work and or endurance riding and all that kind of stuff. So really it was, um, so the blog was, it was putting long distance cycling in my perspective in the hope that actually there's other people out there that will turn around and go, oh yeah, well, I'm in my fifties. I've actually got all this time now that I never used to have when I was bringing up kids or you know, mad, mad career. And um, what can I do? Well, actually, I could go on a long ride for several days and and I can do it. So that was that was what it was all about, really. So, yeah, the, the middle age bit was very deliberate. <laughs> and I think, you know, you've certainly you know thrown all the stereotypes out, out the window with with your achievements. So, <coughs> yeah, I think it's it's a very valid point that, yeah, you, you don't need to be a certain age, a certain sex to, to necessarily do the, the long distance riding. Um, and have you have you always ridden a bike? Is it something that you've kind of taken up later in life or has it always been a, a passion of yours? I've, I wouldn't say it's always been a passion, but I have ridden a bike since, well, I say ridden. I've had a bike since I was four years old, yeah. possibly earlier, um, but I only remember from four years old. But then it was more of a, of a climbing thing because I was very small and everything else was very high. So I used to lean it up against things and climb on it. <laughs> so it would be it would be the when I, when I was a, a child, I'd go over to my local park and, you know, you lean it against a tree and climb up it uh, to yeah, get onto that lower branch yeah. <laughs> but unfortunately my first first ever well my two main injuries in childhood mm. were both bike related so oh. one was when the stabilizers first come off and I got um I got very excited and was riding through my uh, local park you know how things are exaggerated when you're four or five years old yeah. so it was down this tiniest little hill. It wasn't even a hill. It was just that the road wasn't, the path wasn't entirely flat. And I remember shouting, look at me, look at me. I'm doing 30 miles an hour. I was probably doing about four. Um, and hit a stone and over I went and great big hole in my chin. So oh, that was no. my first. Um, and then also climbing up my bike, I was climbing up it to ring the doorbell because I couldn't get in. And... Um, <laughs> yeah the bike went and I ended up with a broken arm but I did end up with the local news in the local newspaper with my broken arm because there was <laughs> Miss GB was opening our local supermarket and they um dragged me out for a photo shoot so she could sign my arm <laughs> oh, fantastic um but after that really it was just a mode of transport it was what I used to get to and from school mm. um and I don't think well, gradually I upgraded from a really heavy weight steel mountain bike that I used to commute to work on yeah. to something a little better. Mm. I won't say a lot better, but just a little <laughs> better. You know, I paid £75 for this bike and it was great. Yeah, I And um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, this was, this is, I'm talking about when I was 18, so it's quite a while ago. <laughs> but then um, because it had a little bit of suspension, it was a little bit lighter. Mm. Um, 
and I used I lived in Somerset so I was not very far from the Quantock Hills mm. so I used to ride to the Quantock Hills and I'd ride up a road bob around on the hills a little bit and come down off road and then find the road again go up a road because I couldn't go up road off road yeah I couldn't go <laughs> uphill off road <coughs> So I used to do that and that was just two miles from my house. So yeah. I used to go out and do sort of, I guess it was about 10, 12 miles. Yeah. No idea how far I went, but just, just mess around in the hills. Really. You're in little mini adventures already. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it wasn't until I moved to Hampshire after I divorced mm. that I decided to actually start to do something else. And I thought I need to do something else. And I was riding around locally. I was, I was the, the typical cafe cyclist, except I was always on my own because I didn't know any other cyclists. Yeah. Um, so I used to just ride around a little bit locally, but I had no idea where anything was out of yeah. town. I was in Portsmouth by then. Yeah. Um, and then on a whim, I saw a charity bike ride in Vietnam. And I worked for a, a big organisation then. I thought, oh, there might be plenty of fundraising opportunities here. <laughs> this would really challenge me. And I knew that once people started putting money in, I know in my own mindset that once somebody else is involved, I can't back out. It's a really good motivator, isn't it? It, it is, yeah. You know, <laughs> there's no way people are going to pay for the charity to encourage me to do this full distance thing. And then me not do the full distance, because in my head, it's like, well, if I don't do the full distance, I have to give all give them all their money back. Yeah. yeah. And I didn't want to do that because then the charity would lose out. So that was the way my mind worked on that very first event. So the event was um, Cycle Vietnam. So I kind of just went for it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I really nice went for it. Up. Yeah. Yes. Before that, I'd never cycled more than 40 miles. I did the a Downs Link um, just as a charity ride, and it was yeah. 40 miles along an old railway path, mostly. Yeah. Very, very minor hills. And um, and it took me all day to do the 40 miles. Yeah. And I was absolutely shattered and couldn't sit on my bike for weeks afterwards. Yeah. So that was that was where I'd come from. Goodness. Um, so, mm. yeah, for Vietnam, I joined um, another group who used to do training rides for the Hailing Paris um, bike ride that they do every yeah. year and they said you know anybody can come along to our rides we do them on Saturday mornings mm -hmm. and we start I think it was something like February or March and and build people up because they want to make sure that anybody that does their ride has had plenty of practice beforehand so again oh, they can yeah. go from zero to hero mm -hmm. but I joined them and that was the first time I'd ever ridden with other people mm -hmm. and it was where I actually started to get to know my local bit of countryside and again, you know, the first time we went and did 40 miles, I was still doing it on a mountain bike. Yeah. Everybody else was, well, not everybody, but a lot of people were on nice slick road bikes. And I was just like, oh dear, it, I just couldn't breathe. And people were trying to talk to me on the right. I was like, I can, I can ride or I can talk. That's it. There's, <laughs> there's no in between. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, but I did Vietnam and it killed me and I was at the back all the time but there were quite there were a group of us at the back yeah but we were also really determined that there was no way we were going to get in the bus apart from anything else when you saw the buses on the roads so there was no way you wanted to get in a bus anyway it <laughs> felt a lot safer it felt a lot safer on a bike but um again if I got in the bus I felt I was um cheating the people that had sponsored me yeah yeah so yeah and it was the final hill that was epic myself and another lady we were the last two up the hill Mm. and well, I say hill it's a flipping great big mountain no yeah. idea how high it was but it was definitely the biggest mountain it took us all day pretty much yeah. to get up it and um we got to the top and everybody else in the group was all cheering us and we were singing um don't stop me now on the way up <laughs> I mean the locals that were walking along yeah. with their buffalo and all their big bags of sticks on their heads they were walking up quicker than we were pedaling up but we were not going to get off and push <laughs> and, and that's what started it yeah. So that's what started it in 2000 and oh hang on I've got the thing up there 2008 November 2008 that was when me trying to discover what I had in me started yeah so it, you know it didn't it, it didn't put you off it didn't deter you this kind of epic feat and the, the big climbs and everything it, it, it no. ignited the smart spark did it more of it <laughs> it did because yeah. um before that I don't I'd always I would go a longer way to avoid going over a hill <laughs> yeah yeah I'd go I'd go round 
yeah i mean even when i even when i lived in somerset um and sometimes i would ride to work which was i think nine miles um and there was one hill i mean i, I look at it now and i'm like that's not a hill that's a pimple <laughs> <laughs> but there was one hill on the way to work and actually if i wasn't in a hurry i would avoid it mm. at all other costs yeah i would go round and i would go on a way that was more gentle yeah. which is ridiculous because it's not even a hill really now yeah. I know that yeah. I think <laughs> but it felt like it felt like Everest at the time yeah it does <laughs> doesn't it when you're starting out it's yeah it's I think it's it's kind of in your head as well though isn't it you you see these these lumps and bumps and it, I think you let them get the better of you sometimes and I think it's often it's one of the stopping points when people are starting out cycling they kind of get this this hurdle of getting over hills and yeah I think it puts people off and it's, it's one of the barriers I think so yeah, yeah well getting up yeah I mean getting up that final mountain um the determination that we had to get up there because it was it was two of us were encouraging each other yeah and we were like we're not getting in the bus we're not getting in the bus we're not getting in the bus we're getting to the top we can see the top we can see it mm. and we just kept we just kept going but it was that that feeling and we stood on top of that mountain and the view and you could see the view was amazing absolutely stunning i mean it was vietnam in all its beautiful glory and it's an amazing place if, if you're cycling through vietnam on your around the world we hope our route's not confirmed yet but vietnam is is looking uh, it is stunning it is absolutely stunning it's one of my Maybe favorite places on hill, earth but yeah <laughs> <laughs> well it depends which route you do yeah. if you're coming from china direction you might not have much choice um <laughs> but anyway <laughs> it's worth it but yeah i stood on top of that hill and we could see this um the road that we'd spent all day climbing up we could see it winding down below us oh. and i just stood there and thought i feel like superwoman yeah if i can do this what else can i do yeah and and that was that was the moment mm. um and after that it was like well i survived this so how much further can i go yeah and and that's that's what's driven me really it's it's trying to work out what my limits are, what mm. my my physical limits are. And at the moment, I haven't found that. I yeah. haven't found out what my limit is. I found out what my limits for sleep are, what my limits for cycling without enough food are, <laughs> and all of those things that actually, if you get those right, yeah. then I don't know how far I can go yet. Yeah. Maybe around yeah. the world. <laughs> <laughs> might, be, might be tagging along. <laughs> but, yeah, looking no, for a tag. <laughs> in the <a> trailer. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it is that, yeah, it's how far can you go? And I think that is is the driving force. And once you get that bug, um, and I think like you did, overcoming such a big challenge, it gives you such a sense of achievement. And it I think you know apart from that moment which is amazing you know looking at back at what you've done thinking wow that was me I did that I think it then spurs you forward as well day to day doesn't it it helps you put everything else in, in perspective too it so does yes think, you know there's a massive benefit from taking on on these these challenges and I think that's something that yeah I'd you know people listening to this I think you'd probably agree with me say just go out and do it and go for it because you yeah you, know, you obviously have haven't you um you said on that ride obviously riding up with somebody else was a big motivation too and before that you'd kind of ridden by yourself a lot is that something you've found has kind of helped you get into the cycling and the the endurance and everything a bit more has it been like the company has it been the su mutual support of others or do you still ride a lot by yourself Oh, I still ride a lot by myself, um, yeah. <laughs> but I do like I, I like riding with people on the maybe the shorter distances and in some challenging sections. It's always nice. It's definitely a lot easier to put your demons to rest when there's somebody else with you. So long as that somebody else isn't expressing their demons as well, of course. Yeah, because <laughs> as soon as you hear that word, uh, I don't think I'm going to carry on anymore. I think I'll catch the train. They've planted the seed. Mm. And I've been victim to that before where um, I was on, I think, my first 300k ride. Yeah. And um, and it was the Oasts and Coasts oh, ride in yeah. Kent. And it's a beautiful ride. And I used to live in, I grew up in Kent, so I always quite like going over to Kent. Yeah. And um, it was a hard, hard ride, not just because it was a 300k and I wasn't fit, but um, we had a headwind all the way across the flat bits 
-hmm. and it was getting stronger and stronger um so yeah it was it was tough and there was a section i think we i'd done maybe 50 60k into a headwind oh, yeah. but there was no there's no relief from it because yeah. it is on a, a load of reclaimed land i don't know if you know kent but it was all along um sort of romney dimchurch highs uh, okay yeah um, okay. there we are yeah <laughs> yeah you get some lumps around folkestone mm. but um i'd got to i was struggling and i i hadn't seen anybody else for hours so I was definitely at the back, but I don't know whether I knew that there had been people behind me. But what I often find is that if there have been people behind me, they've usually dropped off and given up and I end up last anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I hadn't seen anybody for hours. And then I was climbing up at Dover, climbing mm. up past Dover Castle and that a guy is, comes yeah. down. Yeah, that's a nasty climb. Yeah. Um, it's a bit better now they've sorted the road out a bit but it, it used to, it when I did it it was still horrible and narrow yeah and um a guy comes down and I recognized him as somebody who'd passed me earlier he says I've had it he says I'm gonna get on the train he says there's a train station in Dover I'm gonna go I'm, I've, I've had enough oh, goodness and goodness. I was really really struggling and it planted that seed and I thought no yeah. I'm gonna keep going and the thing is is because I was going up over this hill the wind had dropped a little bit Mm. because it was on the other side of the hill um so I, I got up to the castle rode along the top then you come back down again further along and then you've got another flat bit around um sandwich yeah um deal and sandwich so yeah. I went along the seafront at deal and <laughs> went past a hotel with its flags flying well I say flying they looked like they were trying to take off in my direction and that was when it dawned on me just the wind was getting stronger and stronger and stronger mm. and I could barely pedal forwards so um I continued along the road a little bit turned the corner got my made my little purchase in um in the control that I needed yeah and carried on across the sandwich golf course which is incredibly flat and open mm. and and I just couldn't pedal forwards yeah. And I looked at the time and I thought there's no way I, I'd literally got to this previous control on or around the deadline. And if I was going to make progress at the pace of about four miles an hour, yeah. and I still had over well over 100k to go. Oh, yeah. Um, and I thought I can't do this. And I knew that there was still quite a bit of coast to go along. Yeah. And this seed of, well, there's a train station had already been planted and I'd passed yeah. the train station in Deal. And I went back and I got on the train in Deal yeah and i got on the train and it followed the coast along exactly where i would have been riding later oh, on yeah and then i i got off and it was six or seven miles so mm. i'd grab something to eat as well before i got on the train so mm. i ate, ate some food on the train and had probably an hour hour and a quarter on the train it was a very <laughs> a very convoluted route a long yeah. route it's but um yeah. got, got off at the station got on my bike Mm. I was flying oh <laughs> and and yeah that was the moment that I thought if ever you really feel that you can't keep pedaling mm. just eat something and actually stop and have a rest don't keep plowing through because yeah. clearly all I needed was a rest yeah and if I'd have sat down somewhere for half an hour I could have carried on I'd have been out of time but I could have carried on yeah but um, you've completed yeah yeah so um yeah that was my sort of first epic discovery of not giving up and not letting people plant the seed mm. um because yeah. that seed kept growing from dover all the way to sandwich yeah and when you're tired which, or you're low on energy it builds and it builds. exactly it yeah just, so yeah so it's not always great to have someone with you if they're slightly negative or because definitely i've got on the train before when i've been with other people whereas i wouldn't if i'd have been on my own yeah yeah it's so it's yeah quality sometimes isn't it it is and also i think when you're doing the long distance stuff anything over 200k i actually prefer to do on my own now mm. a i need rest is different maybe to the way somebody else needs rest yeah the rest strategies from when rest strategies between different people mm. 
do differ. And um, so I was planning on riding the 2019 PVP with a mm -hmm. friend. She'd not done anything like that before. So we started to get ready and ride together two years earlier. So from the summer, we started to go out and we were doing 200 Ks and 300 Ks. And I wanted to let her work out what her rest strategy would be. Because yeah. I mean, if you get your rest strategy wrong, it just all goes to pot. Yeah. And you might be able to adapt it a little bit so that you're a little bit more in line with each other. But actually, if one person needs a longer stop less often, Mm. and the other person is quite happy with short stops more often it can be tricky so I wanted her to find her way of stopping or her rest strategy yeah and I knew what mine was so with my rest strategy it was always um to try and if it was at around a normal meal time mm. I would make sure that I was stopped for half an hour to three quarters of an hour which I know seems quite long yeah um, for a lot of people but for me one thing I can't do is I can't gulp my food down yeah um which of course if you're stopping for 20 minutes half an hour you've got no choice but to gulp it down and get back on your bike and go so I can't do I can't do that yeah. yeah but I know that an hour is too long and that's wasted time because if I'm set if I'm rested for an hour or if I'm sat down for an hour the chances are that actually 20 minutes of it is just me having a natter with somebody yeah. and that's wasted <laughs> and that's wasted time so between half an hour and three quarters of an hour depending on where you've stopped is, is good for me and I need that and then what happens is as I get back on my bike and within five minutes I'm kind of up to speed it's almost like I've just got on again at the beginning of the ride hmm. my legs have recovered enough and therefore I go a lot faster to start yeah. with um my friend was a different way around so she preferred the 20 it turned out she preferred the 20 minute stop she could eat yeah. her food a bit quicker mm. um but she would have 20 minutes because she said anything more than that and she would have cafe legs afterwards and she would go into a real go slow for that first section yeah and we really we tried and we tried to find somewhere in the middle um and usually on the first control and maybe in the second control as well, we could do that shorter stop. But once it came to, you know, if you're on a 300 K, mm. you've got a control in the afternoon. Well, by then my legs needed to actually have that rest. Yeah. Um, whereas she would still try to do her 20 minutes and out because mm. anything more than that. And she would have a real lull afterwards. But I was the other way around. So in the end what we started doing was starting to do the rides together and actually we would often just meet each other at controls because maybe I'd have got there quicker yeah and stayed there longer yeah she might have been a little bit slower and, and that sort of thing so we'd often we often found each other at the controls anyway yeah. um but definitely on a 200k it was fine once yeah. we got to 300k we could never be in sync with each other even though actually when we rode our bikes Hmm. outside of the or in the middle in between the control bits we were fairly well matched yeah but yeah so unless you're really well matched it's ever so difficult on long hmm. rides obviously if you're on a tandem it's maybe a little bit it, different it does even but... out a bit but it's you know it, it, it's, <laughs> it's simple things like stopping for the loo and things like that that sometimes yeah. you end up doing it stopping twice as much because you just cannot yes. get that synchronized but yeah it means um stay often ride the solos you know to get around all axes and I think that was one of my downfalls around PVP was that I couldn't get the stops synchronized when I needed them because yeah if he needs to stop so it was yeah it's um it does make it make it trickier and I yeah think, um we've kind of got a balance going on and he has to match his pace to mine because he's a lot faster than me um but we, we were hoping last year to start doing more Audax by ourselves riding as you say by yourselves and then we'd met up at control yeah could so yeah but it's, yeah. it's an interesting point certainly that yeah there's there's pros and cons uh, to riding yeah I think I think you have to be, you know, if you're somebody who was always a full value rider anyway, I mean, I'm less of a full value rider now, but um, if you're a full value rider anyway, and you, you have to make the most of your time. Yeah. Being out of sync just is dreadful. Mm -hmm. So myself and my friend, we did, um, or we tried to do the Brian Chapman as one of our qualifiers. 
and um, ride, yeah. <laughs> and I knew in my head I need my strategy to be where I wanted to sleep but I also knew that if I got to I, I knew which time I which time of day or which time of night yeah. was were my danger hours because I'd done enough yeah. of the long ones um, um my danger hours were between well I say my danger hours it's more of a case of if I can get my eyes shut between somewhere between midnight and 2 a.m yeah then I would be fine I could get through to the morning and then yeah. I'd probably have a, a bit of a nap some breakfast and then go yeah um a friend decided to sleep at a particular stop mm -hmm. Now we didn't get to that stop by midnight. We only got to the halfway point by midnight. So I wanted yeah. to shut my eyes for an hour before I carried on. Yeah. And I knew that if I didn't, I wouldn't I wouldn't make it to the next control. Yeah. Um so in the end it was more of a 10 minute nap with your head on the table while everybody yeah. else is eating and yeah. then off we went. But I was good for about an hour and then I was falling asleep on the bike because I hadn't had that hour an hour would have done it yeah but again that was because I was with somebody else and she was going come on come on we can get to the hostel and then we can have a proper bed and we can have a shower and oh, it's, all it's of that long, but I couldn't get there ride. yeah yeah and I, I couldn't I've get there the same position and I think yeah okay. and I had to leave her to, I had to leave her to go on but we picked somebody else up as well or yeah. another couple of guys up as well as we left the um, turnaround point and um, so she was quite happy chatting to them. And I said, look, I said, if I drop off, just carry on. I says, because if I drop off, it's because I need a nap. Yeah. Um, and I will have just found somewhere. And in the end, I found a bench and, and I stopped on this bench and had a, a power nap. But the problem was, was between those two controls, I think I probably needed to stop four or five times for these little naps yeah. just to get me to the control. Mm -hmm. So I, I lost well over an hour, hour and a half. Yeah. And, and my friend was in there asleep mm. and as I arrived she'd just got up yeah and you, um, more you know so not so yeah familiar. yeah so so I stopped and I had an hour but it wasn't great <laughs> um, but the whole thing slowed me down because it wasn't my strategy yeah. yeah so that's why actually I've just just prefer now to ride them alone you know ride an event with people but not actually with them all the time yeah have that flexibility I think I think does make yeah a big difference doesn't it yeah yeah so obviously the the big one we should probably <laughs> come on to is your, your amazing achievement this summer riding um Land's End, John O'Groats and back again <laughs> <laughs> in a rather spectacular time I just it's 11 days, 13 hours and 13 minutes, I think was, was very That's it, well, yes. Isn't it? Yes. Um, and yeah, having then gone through the, the rigmaroles of getting it submitted to Guinness, I believe it is now the official record too, isn't it? Uh, not quite yet, no. Quite. I'm still, no, I'm still doing my submissions. Um, I don't know if you've looked at the Guinness guidelines yet. Um, I, I have a copy for our trip. I have, yeah, the application <laughs> and I've got a um a fire watch of paper back so yes it, it's um as well as having it all logged um so i've got all the gps bits that's the easy bit yeah um it's the 10 minutes of video per day yeah along with all of the signed witness statements yes yeah. which is tricky so i'm having to be a little bit creative um <laughs> When I say creative, I don't mean I'm making things up because I'm not. Um, but I've got some days I've got loads more video. Yeah. Other days I've got video of me doing my Facebook lives, yeah. which is usually in a hotel room or by the side of the road or something like that. But it's not really a video of the route. Yeah. Um, it's just me talking about it. I have no idea whether or not that's acceptable, but that's what they're going to get, yeah. as well as um, a video reel of lots of photographs taken along the way. So that's how I'm going to make my 10 minutes video. Yeah. Um, in addition, oh, I posted one on YouTube. So that's yes, that's so. that's what they're yeah. getting. That's what they're <laughs> getting for my video. Um, they get one of those for every day. Yeah. But the witness statements is a bit more tricky because I did have a book and I was all ready to do the book and get people yeah. to sign it or whatever. But that meant stopping a ridiculous amount of time. Yeah. Times when I was already my discipline was already a bit poor. 
and my husband Dale wasn't with me wasn't alongside me he was often 10 miles ahead yeah so if I had if somebody had come and met me or somebody had seen me in a lay-by or whatever was I really going to stop in every single lay-by and say oh can you sign my book it just wasn't practical yeah so I'm gonna what I am going to be doing is pulling all the snippets off the Facebook group yeah which shows you know saw her here here's the photograph things and I'm gonna have to hope that's okay yeah but that takes a ridiculous amount of time to do <laughs> and I'm I'm still putting that together so as soon as I put that together I can submit it so you get a year to submit it okay so um, but I'm hoping to get it done in the next month or so yeah uh, but yeah it's a lot of work trying to pull all that back out together it would have been easier if I'd have easier to submit if I'd have had the book yeah and I haven't ever really signed in it but it probably would have taken me 13 days if I'd have stopped to gather that evidence. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a whole <laughs> other level to add to what's already it is. a challenging event. But yeah, so, we... but they what they did do was I said said that, you know, the time that I did wasn't what you wanted me to do. Hmm. Um, and I explained the reasons why. Um, yeah. And they came back and said, well, if, if the evidence is OK, then we'll allow that. So that's where we're at at the moment. So if they like my evidence and if they agree my evidence, then it will be the official world record. But at the moment, it's an unofficial world record, but it's definitely the fastest known time. I was about to say, it's <laughs> the FKT at the very least. It's an FKT yeah. at the very least. Yeah, yes. You, you certainly had enough challenges along the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think the weather was probably one of the main ones, wasn't it? But it was, it was, you know, following you a lot. It was by no means an easy ride, was it? And no. plenty of complications to deal with. So, yeah, do you, you know, what was the kind of the, the stuff? Was it the weather or was it the, the, the route? Were the things you'd have done differently? <laughs> oh, how long have you got? How long have you got? Um, yeah. What would I do differently? Loads. Um, so the the weather was definitely a challenge so there were things that didn't go well that I had that were my doing and there were things that didn't go well that were completely outside of my control so the weather obviously was out of my control yeah, sure. um I couldn't really shift the dates um there was too much in place already yeah. including hotel rooms my husband having time off that sort of yeah. thing so the dates couldn't shift and we knew the storm was coming through and I'd done quite a bit of my training in storms as well when I'd done I did two long weekends riding where I was riding did the right distances over three days mm -hmm. and on one of those a big storm came through as well and I basically spent one day absolutely soaked so I kind of I knew we'd had a glorious summer but actually I'd been out riding in a couple of these storms and you know they say in training that if things don't go well in training then the things that that you're prepared for when you do the actual ride so I was prepared for a storm um so that was fine mm. it slowed me down it made me soaked through yeah there were you know the reason I put my Garmin in a plastic bag was because I know that there's whilst they might be waterproof there's only so much waterproof and they freeze <laughs> after a while when they get so much water on their um, screens mm -hmm. they freeze and the touch screen stops working yeah um and I couldn't see so but I put it in this plastic bag I'd seen this plastic bag it was almost exactly the same size as my garment I thought that'll do it so mm -hmm. I'll be able to see through it yeah but the, the actual garment itself won't get wet well mm -hmm. that was fine but the plastic bag condensated up so I still couldn't see oh. the garment carried on working but I couldn't see it yeah. And also my fingers were so wrinkly that they wouldn't operate touchscreen anyway because <laughs> I couldn't dry me off. Yeah. So I couldn't. Um, yeah. So my navigation was a bit. It would have been fine if it had rained like that on the A30 because I knew exactly where I was going. But for in the Lake District yeah. and going up through the Lake District to Scotland, I didn't really know where I was going and whether I was on the right route. And yeah. I was going through. I had to get through Kendall in the rain, Penrith in the rain. And Carlisle in the rain, and I couldn't see. Yeah, and it's bad enough that I'd also I'd managed to navigate myself down some one-way streets anyway. But um, yeah, I couldn't see where I was going, so it was kind of guesswork. And in the end, it was like, right, well, okay, I know where I've got to go next. The next place I've got to go is Carlisle, so I'll follow the signs to Carlisle and hope it doesn't leave me on the M6. Yeah, and that was how I managed to find my way out in the end. I, I right, well, is it? 
or sometimes I'd get my phone out and Google maps it, uh, Google yeah. map it, and, and it's like, right, well, actually, I know I've, I need to stick to the A6, so I'll just follow the signs on the A6 and hope I get there. And that's how I navigated myself around in the end. Um, so yeah, so the weather definitely had prob caused me problems with navigation, yeah, and saddle sore because I was so wet. That was where the saddle sores came about. Um, but the other thing was my navigation. Well, it wasn't my navigation, it was my route planning. My route planning was shocking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, it, hence yeah. ending up... We did it for, you know, funner than the summer, and that was hard enough trying to pick a, a, a route that was directional and not too arduous, but yeah, it's, uh, it's trying to get that balance, isn't it? And especially if you're trying to do it fast, it's... I can imagine trying to pick the, the roads where, yeah, you, you're going to get there <laughs> with enough yeah. speed. It's, it's not easy, is it? Well, I'd been given some advice because obviously once Guinness came back and said that I had to do it in eight and a half days, I yeah. completely rechanged changed my route because mm -hmm. I knew I needed it, needed to do it on the fastest road types yeah. and the shortest distance. Mm -hmm. um, so whilst we were down south, navigated it down south I was fine yeah once I got to towards the northwest I have no real knowledge of the northwest at all mm -hmm. so it started all to go a little bit pear-shaped from there really mm -hmm. um one bit of navigation I did I came off of oh somebody had said to me route planning somebody else who'd done a lands into John O'Groats as a record had said I know you've got a lot of main roads and I know why, but sometimes there are some parallel roads that are not the main roads that are actually worth taking. Yeah. Um, so if you can maybe find some of those, it will just take the sound of traffic away, take a little bit of stress away. Yeah. And so I thought about that and there was one place on the A49 where the A49 kind of did a, a D shape the, cur mm -hmm. the curved bit of the D shape and I could see there was a road that did the straight up bit of, yeah. of a D yeah I thought well that makes sense I might as well just take that mm. it'll be shorter it'll knock me off a couple of miles and I um so when I navigate and I'm on a road that I'm not sure about I'll get my google maps bit up or, yeah. and put my little google man on the road and yeah. have a good look around and like oh yes this doesn't look like it's a single track country lane yeah. this is probably okay but it's like well how far along do you do it so yeah so I did that on this road as it was just after Ludlow mm. between Ludlow and Church Stretton I think so I put it down there and I was like oh this looks like a really nice road it was nice and it was straight and it was past the race course do you know what I'll take this this is a shortcut it'll get me off this A49 which I, I had been on would have been on for hours yeah. and I knew I had to get back on it but it would just give me that little bit of break I thought yeah. So as I got onto this road, it's like, oh yeah, this was a good choice. This is a nice road. And it was flat and it was quiet and there was no traffic on it and the views were lovely. Yeah, for about a mile and a half. <laughs> and, it, <laughs> and I hadn't put my Google map man down far enough and it turned into a little windy little country lane. It was beautiful. Yeah. And if you're doing lands into John O'Groats as a tour. I absolutely thoroughly recommend it. Yeah. You're trying to do it as a world record, not recommended. Probably not. Quite. So that was the first of the roads that I wasn't going to take coming back again. <laughs> there were quite a few that day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it, it's certainly tricky. And it's one of the things that, yeah, we're going to have to find a, a way around or or we, we may well end up making <laughs> the same mistakes because yeah trying to, to plan the whole world road by road I think is going to be quite a, an epic feat but I think it's it's one of the challenges you get isn't it so yeah. yeah route planning was definitely something that I but the thing is the route planning I can fix that's quite easy because on the way back I chose better routes yeah. I didn't always know where I was but obviously people would come <laughs> and help me and go your route coming up was dreadful here use this one coming back <laughs> see that's another thing that I don't know whether it, Guinness are going to accept or not because it wasn't the route coming back wasn't the route that I'd said I was going to be doing yeah so. but we'll see we'll see <laughs> <laughs> well I, regardless it's you know it's it's an amazing achievement and you know the 
you could sense through your blog and your updates and everything that the the amount of endurance you put in was was truly astounding (laughs) it was a a very inspiring thing to to follow along the way um thank you uh, you know you certainly deserve the the guinness record regardless (laughs) of of what they made of all the submissions the guinness the guinness record for stubbornness and refusing to give up (laughs) that's that's what that's what i do deserve i was definitely stubborn i wasn't going to give up i cried a bit though (laughs) Uh, yeah, no, I think I think all the best riders do on <laughs> thing. And would you say? I mean, yeah, you, you've obviously. Would you ever go back and do it again? Or I might this now. Year. No, I am yeah. thinking of doing it again this year, but there yeah, are wow. things that will have to be very different. Yeah. So, if I do it again, <laughs> I need. So yeah. So the other thing before I go back to if I do it again I would do it differently because the other thing that we didn't get right at all was support um and I laid way too much on my husband I mean originally I was going to do it unsupported but Guinness still came back and said you've got to do it in eight and a half days which is impossible and it's, well, it's I say it's I say it's impossible somebody else will come along and do it in eight and a half days and it, yeah. <laughs> but the point was was that they set the standard for somebody they didn't set the standard for unsupported because they don't recognize the difference between supported and unsupported and I understand their reasons um but you can't set the standard so high that it's impossible to do it unsupported yeah and I had a lot of arguing with them because originally they came back and said I had to do it in seven days yeah which is just yeah which was just mind-blowing um and it's it's the same for the round the world record. I mean, Mark Beaumont holding it in seventy eight days, which was fully supported. Yeah, it's, it's, it, you know that's the same. And there's there's just no way you could get anywhere no. with that without a, a, you know the whole support crew in place. So yeah, well, this is what it was him that I used as the example. I said, look, I said he got the world record twice. First, when he did it in was it one hundred and seventy eight days or whatever it was. So you allowed and you allowed him that. Yeah because he did that unsupported and then he came along 10 years later or whatever and did it in 78 days yeah uh, but now if you set it and say it has to be 78 days you're setting it up so that it can only be done on an entirely fully supported ride which is not in with the guinness sort of ethos really yeah yeah and their mission statements so i kind of quoted them back their mission statements and things like that and they agreed to meet me halfway for eight and a half days but yeah. originally i wanted to do it in 10 yeah and actually i think if i'd have set it at 10 in the first place i'd have probably done it yeah and that that's the crazy thing yeah. and it was the fact that i was pushing it to try and do it in the eight and a half days that it meant that i was pushing it to try and go too far mm. too soon yeah, because if I'd have done it, to do it in ten days, I would have had to do it in, I think, one hundred and eighty miles a day. Yeah, but if I'd set it for one hundred and eighty miles a day, I probably could have done that. Yeah, it was that extra twenty miles plus every day. Yeah, that actually caused the problem. And in the end, after the first two days, I think I don't think I got more than one hundred and fifty miles. Some days, considerably less. Yeah, yeah. Well. <laughs> so it was. Uh, yeah, it was what it was. But um, I, I laid a lot on my husband as support. So he had to be media manager, mm. driver, yeah. um, cook, yeah. <laughs> um, temporary navigator. Um, yeah, he had a lot of duties yeah. and, and it was just him, which is ridiculous. So basically, if I wasn't sleeping, he wasn't sleeping. Yeah. So yeah. this is part of the reason why he wasn't alongside me all the way, because I'd say, right, well, if you can go meet me here. Mm. So he'd maybe go to the next town or two towns down, depending on yeah. how close the towns were. Because I'd say, well, I can be I'm quite happy in between. I've got yeah. everything I need. Just you go and be 10, 15 miles down the road. And that gave him a chance to rest, except that he said he wasn't resting because he was trying to get my food ready or doing my social media and things like that or taking the dog for a walk because we had the dog with us. <laughs> you know there was so much and in the end you know he because he was moving all the time it was things like I absolutely craved a jacket potato but he didn't have time to go find me one and we didn't have an oven in the van yeah he couldn't make me one yeah um and the some of the food that we had after two days I just couldn't stomach it anymore 
yeah so i just couldn't eat it and i it's wanted yeah. a jacket potato cheese and beans or yeah. something something ordinary mm. i mean he, he made it a mission to go find me pies at one point because i walked <laughs> I, I rode past somewhere and i thought i could smell pie i want a pie i want a pie and i want a pie now <laughs> So he was on a mission to try and find me a pie at lunchtime. He did. He found me. He found me pies a few times. Yeah, but I could always manage to eat pie. It turned out. <laughs> yeah, I think he 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 deserves a Guinness World Record too. He it, does it's an immense job being the support of these rides. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, that was one of the things that I thought. You know, he he put in so much effort. But if you had just had a few more people to back you up, I think it would have exactly. Been wouldn't it so yeah. yeah so if I do it again I will have a team a minimum team of four and yeah. two vehicles um I've kind of got it worked out um because I think if I've got four yeah. you've got two people in each vehicle which means one person isn't left to do all the driving they can take yeah. it in turns um and also it means that maybe the driver's taken a rest whilst the other person is preparing food and all of that kind of stuff so yeah I mean the food didn't eat I, at a fraction of what I needed to eat to fuel myself yeah and and the days when I, I managed to sit down and eat my body weight in food yeah I had a good day yeah when I didn't I didn't have a good day so fueling is so important yeah. and I'm a pescatarian but um when it comes to these endurance rides I'll eat anything yeah well, yeah almost it almost <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> steak but steak and kidney pies were definitely a thing that i craved <laughs> so i ate quite a bit of steak and kidney wow. pie it all goes in the tank doesn't it so. it does exactly and pork pies one of my favorites <laughs> <laughs> pork pie in the back pocket it's uh yeah uh, my husband would try to that as well i think so. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good old actually but yeah, yeah, I mean, certainly I think, you know, now people have seen your story and yeah, there were so many people following you along the way cheering you on. I would, I dearly hope that, yeah, you'll be overwhelmed with offers of support should you, <laughs> should you brave it again. So I, I, know yeah. I think that would make a, a really, really big difference um, <laughs> to your ride. Um, but it's, it's back to um, understanding where my limits are, because when I got to the end, despite the fact that I was ridiculously tired, it mm. was only, it was tiredness in my head. I couldn't keep my eyes open. Yeah. Um, and it was just that I needed a good sleep. Mm. Um, but I could have got back. Well, if it wasn't for my, my rear end, I could have got back on the bike and ridden another 200 miles the next day. Yeah. So I knew that I wasn't at my limit. Yeah. And if I'd have got everything right, if I'd have got, if I'd have been disciplined, if I'd have got my food right, if I'd have got my roots right, I could have done it in eight and a half days. I know I could do it in eight and a half days. Uh, this is the thing, is I know I can. Yeah. It's frustrating to get to the end and know that you've given it everything you can got to get to the end based on the circumstances at the time. And that I did, and that I know. Yeah. But I also know that had I changed some of those things that I had control over, that I could have done more yeah so yes we, we, uh, yeah this this, this, <laughs> this story isn't finished yet i don't think no, unless no. of course somebody comes and unless of course another woman comes along and does it in seven days in which case i'll go well done no, i think it's that's that. me that's that's <laughs> me done i'll look for another challenge because <laughs> i you know i i know that there probably there are limits in time hmm. Yeah. I don't think there's limits in what my legs will do, but I think there's limits in the time scales I can do it in. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, it's already a tremendous achievement. I think that's a very, very <laughs> exciting prospect for the future, certainly. Um, Thank you. Just to just to round us off quickly, I have got some tandem trivia for you. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> have have you ever ridden a tandem? <laughs> um, <laughs> I got on the back of one once with my son. <laughs> my son was working as a tour guide, a mountain bike guide in the Alps. And I went out wow. to visit him. This was years ago. I went out to visit him and he said, come on. He said, we'll have a day on the bikes. So I said, well, I could hire one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He could hire one. But we got to this hire shop. and He said, we should hire a tandem mum. <laughs> now, he's, he was a quid, pretty much no fear type mountain biker. Mm -hmm. And I was quite happy being in control of what went on with my bike. So, uh, so he said, well, let's try it. So we, 
we got this tandem and we went down the road mm -hmm. on it and we went around the first roundabout and I turned around to my son and said, turn it around, go back. We're getting separate bikes. <laughs> <laughs> It's that a was bit the extent, isn't it? That's yeah. that's the extent of me going on a tandem. And um, we've often thought about it. I've often thought about it with my husband. Yeah. But he goes off. He goes off without me anyway on a normal bike. So, yeah, I I think me going on a tandem is is unlikely to happen. <laughs> I, I I have control issues. <laughs> <laughs> well, that leads me nicely onto my next question. So, if if you were to ride a tandem. And you could ride it with anybody in the world. It could be a cyclist. It could be, you know, a, a pop star. It could be anybody in the whole world. Who would you ride it with? And would you be on the front or the back? Oh, front or back. Oh, tricky one. Um, <laughs> I'd ride a tandem with Mark Beaumont and I'd let him go on front. Yeah, that's a good answer. I think that'd be a, a good way to see the world, wouldn't it? I'll I think I'd, I think I'd probably trust him. Yeah, I think that's the you've got to, you've got to trust the, the the person that's that's helming the the, the ship, as it were. So yeah, yes, a very good answer. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, obviously, yeah, being on Tandy, you're, you're joined by the frame um, for for very long rides. What are you joined by the frame to? What what can you not do without on on your odd axes on your long rides? Is there a luxury item? Is there something that you've got to have with you, um, or is it you know a, a food something like that? Uh, it's not a food. What would I have? I do like my gadgets, so yeah. I would say I can't be without either my Garmin or my phone yeah I don't necessarily need both but the ability to actually know where I'm going or yeah. how to get there actually to me is really really important so some form of navigation yeah I think, I I, think that's fair enough and probably <laughs> did so, no. more than anything and a comfy saddle obviously <laughs> <laughs> and then finally um what would you what would you say to us in terms of why should we ride a tandem around the world? Oh, because it's going to be amazing. <laughs> it's just going to be amazing. <laughs> Perfect. Right answer, I think. Thank you so much, Marcia, for your time. It's been fantastic to hear about all your experiences. And it sounds like, yes, whatever you do in the future will be immensely exciting as well. So we really look forward to hearing about that. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Time. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. Oh, no problem. <laughs>